Hi, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Mari, and today I'm going to be telling you all about my experience moving to South Korea. I'll be giving you all my tips and tricks to make the experience as easy as possible for you. So yeah, let's go ahead and dive right in. First thing you need to do is figure out your purpose for going to South Korea and that will determine what kind of visa you need to get. So for me, I want to be an English teacher and so I went through a lot of different avenues to try to find a teaching job. And so one of the most popular ways is using a recruiter. I used Adventure Teaching. Um, they're a company based in Canada and they hook up schools in South Korea with people that are looking for jobs in the US and Canada. Um, and I found that to be really helpful because they had a lot of detailed information about all the documents and things that I would need to be able to apply for a visa. That's the most important thing you need to do is figuring out all the documents that you need and getting them ready as fast as possible. From start to finish, the process took me almost four months of preparing all my documents and actually applying for the visa and then physically getting the visa. It took a really long time, a lot longer than I was expecting, so you'll want to get on that as soon as possible. So some of the documents that I needed were an FBI background check, uh, a notarized and apostilled copy of my diploma, passport photos, things like that. But it really depends on the visa that you're getting. So for example, my husband Joseph, he's just here on a regular tourist visa and we both have US passports. So he can just get in for 90 days on just having his physical passport. He doesn't need to apply for a visa. But because I was wanting to work, I had to apply for a special work visa. In this case, it's an E2 visa. Visa. So once a lot of my documents were ready, I needed to actually find a teaching job. And like I said before, I used a recruiter at first, which was really helpful for finding all those documents, but none of the interviews that they found for me ended up working out exactly how I wanted them to. So I ended up putting my resume on a website online called Work and Play. There are several different websites that are similar to that one, but that's just the one that I ended up finding the school that I'm working with currently through. Um, but yeah, you just put on your resume and then that's that's really the application process is like applying to put your resume onto the website. You'll fill out a lot of information about yourself that the schools can see and decide if they want to move forward with the process. Once you're done filling out all the information that you need to and uploading your resume, they often also will need a photo of you and you'll answer a few other questions just about you personally. And then they often will reach out to you in an email and want to have an interview or, or some kind of FaceTime call. Um, the one that I did was through Skype and it was really easy to set up. It's usually in Korean time so just be aware of that so you don't get on at the wrong time. I did get on for an interview at the wrong time which was quite awkward, but if you just look at the times ahead, then you can avoid that. Once you're done with the interview phase, then you go on to negotiating a contract, and that can look different for a lot of different schools. Most schools will have a template already set out that they'll send to you, and you can kind of read over and look at the salary and benefits and things like that, and then negotiate it a little bit depending on your experience and just how long you've been teaching in addition to what kind of experience you have. Um, and that really just depends a lot on the school. Different locations will offer different benefits and different salaries, so just make sure that you're aware of that before you sign a contract. Um, and then after that, the school will offer you the job, you will sign the contract, and then they will have you send over all of the documents that you've been preparing earlier, such as the background check, your diploma copy, things like that, and that allows them to sponsor your visa. So once they put in all of those documents, they can give you a visa issuance number. That number is really important because then you will put that on your actual visa application, which will be sent to the nearest Korean consulate and that will ultimately give you your visa. Oh, and as a side note, just be aware too that because of COVID right now, this whole process is taking a lot longer than it normally does, usually even a lot longer than it will say on the website. For example, even after I had my visa sponsored and everything and submitted all the documents, it still took about four weeks for my visa to be processed, which is a lot longer than it normally would take. Um, so just keep that in mind with every step of the process. 
So the next thing you need to do before departing is preparing all of your documents and putting them together. All of your documents that were sent to get your visa are gone now, but you do still need a few things like your actual visa confirmation paper and other documents that you may need. You can put them in a folder. That's what I did. I found it to be the easiest way to organize everything. So then once you get to immigration, it's all right there and easy to pull out. Um, another thing you need to do beforehand is make sure to get a COVID test. That's just for right now. That could change at some point, but it really depends on the airline that you're going to be taking. So we had to go to one of those rapid COVID testing places and it ended up costing about $100 per person. And that's just because we needed a very specific kind of test in a very quick turnaround. And it has to be within the 72 hours of when your flight is leaving is when you take the test. So you make sh gotta make sure that it gets back in time too because not all of the places will have the similar turnaround time. Once we arrived at the airport, things went pretty much as you would expect it to go. We went through airport security, we got some food before getting on the plane, and then yeah, we just had our 11 and a half hour flight. It was a direct flight from Seattle to Incheon, and it was a pretty good flight. There wasn't very many people on it. It was really underbooked, so there was a lot of empty seats. And we just spent most of the time eating some of the meals they gave us and watching movies and sleeping. But overall, it was a really good flight. Once we arrived at the airport, we went through immigration, which was probably the most stressful part of that day specifically. It was just a long line of people and you were getting funneled into different areas. Joseph and I were trying our best to stick together because a lot of our documents had to do with each other, such as our marriage license and things like that. So we went, we went through, we had our folder that had our COVID tests, our marriage certificate, all of that kind of information. And we went through probably four or five different checkpoints. People were checking our temperature. They were having us fill out documents about where we're staying. They were calling someone that we knew to make sure that they could vouch for us to get into the country and things like that. So it was really helpful for us to have all of our information written out. We had that marriage certificate. We had the negative COVID tests. We had all the forms that we filled out on the plane um, that they give you on the plane before you arrive. And then we also had all the information about our Airbnb as long as the Airbnb owner's phone number to give to the immigration officers. All right, and this leads us to our fourth part, which is the quarantine. So once we were through immigration, that's when we kind of were split off from a lot of the other foreigners. Because of my E2 visa, I was able to quarantine in a different place, like my own residence, rather than a government facility. And usually they only allow people with long-term visas to do that, but that's why I brought the marriage certificate, was to show that I was married to Joseph, and even though he wasn't here on a long-term visa, he could still quarantine with me. So that did add one extra step to the process, but of course it was worth it. We were able to actually save money and stay in a nicer place with the Airbnb. Because we were quarantining in our own place rather than a government facility, we also had to download an app and we check into it twice a day, once in the morning and once at night. We take our own temperatures and we put in any symptoms that we have. This is just a general health check that people have to do when they quarantine at home. If you are quarantining in a government facility, then you don't need to worry about food because they'll bring it to you for each meal every day. Um, but, but because we are at an Airbnb, we had to figure out a way to get food delivered. It is a little difficult using delivery apps here just because we didn't have a Korean phone number. Um, so we found a few ways around it. We found an online website called Trazi and that allowed us to get some breakfast kind of groceries delivered. You can also get a taxi and a lot of other things through that website without using a Korean phone number. So that was really helpful. Another thing that we used was the app Shuttle and that you can get a lot of like food from restaurants delivered that way, which was quite delicious and worked out really good. I'm not quite sure how it works at a government facility, but since we are quarantining at an Airbnb, we do have to leave to go to a health center twice during our quarantine to get COVID tests. Once was on the first day that we got here and we'll have to go again on our second to last day so two days before we leave as well just to make sure that we're still testing negative negative. and in government facilities i have heard that people will just come to your room to give you the covid test but i think that also depends on which facility you're put into the fifth and final part is about accommodations so as you can see and as i've talked about already we are in an airbnb right now i do have a video up on my channel already with an apartment tour if you want to see the whole apartment I'm just in the upstairs right now. This is just the bedroom of our loft apartment. It's really cute and really fun just to live in this style of apartment. We've never
never lived in something like this before. But we will be moving after our quarantine to a different Airbnb, actually. So that's what I would recommend doing, depending on the length of your stay. There can be a lot of scams of people trying to like sell you an apartment and get a deposit out of you online. So make sure you aren't giving people money without going to see an apartment first and signing a contract because um, I have heard about a lot of scams. That's why I, we ended up doing Airbnb just because we needed to get a place without seeing it first. Um, and that's definitely what I would recommend if someone is in a similar situation. All right, that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to see more content related to life in South Korea, make sure you like this video and subscribe to my channel, and I'll see you next time.